You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 on Instagram and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we welcome in Lauren Klein, co-founder and attorney of Flourish Law Group, a modern estate planning law firm uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but servicing clients all over Florida. Uh, Lauren's also a success coach for law students and new lawyers. Welcome in, Lauren. Thank you, Benny. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I just wanted to point out that I went back through the quote unquote lawyer stories archives and saw that you submitted your story back in March 2nd, uh, 2022. So almost like over two years ago. And so I just want to say, um, you know, thanks for your support along the way as I try to grow this brand. Yeah, you're killing it. You're killing it. Thanks for spotlighting me back then. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. Um, so I'm just curious, and I think I know the answer to this based on where you went to school, but are you a Floridian born and raised? Born and raised, born and born. raised all my days. So Southeast Florida, what town, what city? Yeah, so I actually was born and grew up in the Dania Beach area, which okay. not a lot of people know about, but that's actually where the Fort Lauderdale airport is. Okay, nice. That's so I grew up in a little town just south of Fort Lauderdale. And I now live in Fort Lauderdale, so I didn't go very far. It's amazing. I often fly in there when I come, when I go down there. Um, so, so Lauren, tell us, um, when did you know you wanted to be a lawyer? Like, was it a moment that you had, or was it just something like you grew up, you liked reading something or what, tell us about that. I did. I loved, I loved reading growing up and I've always been very argumentative, or at least that's what my parents tell me. And so they always said, you know, you might want to be a lawyer. Um, And I always thought that might happen, but I I ended up going the finance route in undergrad. And I was interning at one of the, you know, big brokerage houses right as the world was crumbling, like 2008, 2009. And and the broker I was interning for, it's like, you might want to do something else, you know, for for a little while. I was like, well, I guess I'll go to law school. That's always something I, I thought I might do. Didn't know if I would actually practice. Didn't know what area of law. Kind of figured maybe real estate. I love real estate. And I ended up taking a tax class, kind of, I was forced by a professor to take a tax class. It sounded awful to me. Yeah. And I fell in love. And I, <laughs> really? I know, I was very surprised. I re- something in my brain, it just clicked. Wow. The way that okay. the code works. Like, it's very, like, the ta- tax law is code-based, and it just worked yep. for my brain. Um, and okay. so I got the tax LM after that, and I realized, as I kind of moved through my career, I really... I mean, I was in a very similar place that I would have been in finance. Now I work with, you know, financial advisors yep. day in and day out. So it kind well, that, of was that's very huge. I mean, I, you know, you have like the history of like an incredible education with fi- like, I was going to, I want to go into the LLM a little more, but um, I want, I want to get there. Cause I think that that's so important. And the fact that you went through that year at, um, in Gainesville, UF was like, um, that's not easy. Like that's hard stuff. But so let me just ask you something about law school real quick, like in St. Thomas. So, you know, they recently changed the name, Ben Crump. He's our guy. We had him on the podcast a while back. Nice guy. Um, So like, what was your law school experience like? I, it was kind of a a mixed bag. I really, I love reading. I love being in school. So I really, there was a big part of me that really enjoyed it. Um, And there was another part of me that just was completely, I have no lawyers in my family. I felt so unprepared. I felt so like fish out of water wow. very stressed out um all the time I, and i i enjoyed it but it just felt like i was not prepared for it you know at all and so i i struggled a bit um yep. just yep. feeling comfortable in my own skin and being willing to take risks and you know sign up for things mm-hmm. like law review i just kind of felt like who am i to do those things like i'm not fancy i don't really know what all those things even mean or why do i care that i need to do those things like i didn't have like a clear path thank okay. goodness it all worked out well 
Yeah. Um, but it, it was a bit of a struggle. And St. Thomas is a very tough school. I yeah. didn't really, I just thought yeah. that's how law school was, but it's a very tough school. Like they bring a lot of people in and then they kick people out. Right. And they're, right. they're tough. You know, I have friends that went to UF or Stetson and they're like, our professors are so nice. I'm like, I right. just got kicked out of class for, you know, whatever. And it was, so it was a mixed bag. I really did. I enjoyed it. I made great friends. One of my best friends to this day, you know, we went to law school together. It was, okay. it was kind of a rough road. Okay. Well, that, that's good. That's like kind of, well, not good, but it's like humbling a little bit. It's, you know, it's humanizing to, to know that, you know, like you're not admitting say, or you're saying like you breeze through it. I mean, I law school's really not meant to be easy. Right. So, um, what, yeah. what advice, and I know you, you are mentoring law students now you have the law school success blueprint, I think coming out soon, but, um, tell me, give us some advice, just quick advice. We'll talk about the other stuff later, but some quick advice you would tell a first year law student. I mean, the, probably the biggest piece of advice I would give is just start to network and build your relationships as soon as you can. I know it might feel like one L year is too soon to do that, but yeah. just start to meet people, meet people that you genuinely like and that you really could see modeling your career after them. You know, see, it could be people in different practice areas, whatever, but just get to know people that you see out in the world doing what you want to do and with a lifestyle that you want just get yeah. to know them, you know, offer to take them out for coffee or whatever, and just build, build that relationship and start building that network. That is like my biggest piece of advice. So yes, great grades are important. You know, all the things are important, the things you do, the activities, but the people, you know, when you're applying for jobs, if they see your name and they know you and they remember yeah. that you kept in touch and kept up with them, they will be a lot more likely to hire you. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like it's only a few kids who actually do that. Maybe I'm wrong because I was one of the people who really didn't. And I think like maybe everybody else was doing that, but it seems like not a lot of people actually heed that advice. It's like kind of 20, 20, hindsight 2020 type of thing. Like, oh man, I wish I yeah. used these skills that I had to just like meet, meet and meet people, you know, because it really is. And it doesn't have to be just like going and handing out business cards. It can be creating your LinkedIn profile and connecting with people, like whatever, however you feel comfortable doing it. It doesn't have to be like icky networking. It's just relationship building. Yeah, I don't even think we had links LinkedIn when I was in law school. I think we were getting out of the Friendster area. Uh, era, era. I don't know if you remember <laughs> something called I do, Friendster. I do. Lines, but I'm old, so um, <laughs> tell. I want to. So that LLM, like that, that really is interesting to me because I think that's like it fits really well into like what you're doing. And you took that other that extra step, like, and you admitted you you just said law school was not a breeze. It was difficult, but then something like connected when you wanted to do, you said a professor maybe like encouraged you to go and you, you went to UF. So you lived in Gainesville for a year and or whatnot. And tell me about yeah. that LM experience. I, the one thing I remember from tax class, I don't know why, I said this before on the show, but like Glenshaw Glass was like the first class. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that, like what is income? <laughs> and then after that in my tax class, it was like, that's it. So anyway, <laughs> tell me about the LLM experience. Uh, I had a blast. I mean, it's so funny, which is funny because I was just reading the internal revenue code every day, but it was just, it was so cool because law school, I feel like is very theoretical. And this was very much like, we're going to sit down and we're going to learn how to read the code and how to be a tax lawyer and so it was just like 30 or 40 of us sitting around like actually learning how to like practical tax questions and so it was really like real life you know and really i learned so much that year we just we just literally it was tax law all day every day so let me um, ask, the people yeah. i went to school with were great i mean gainesville's awesome yeah yeah did you like do anything fun while you were there for a year? I mean, you had this big. Yeah. Trip. Okay. It's so funny. The first semester, I, I really, really worked hard. By the second semester, because it's only two semesters right. plus the summer, I had a job already. So I was like, oh, I can kick back and relax. Oh, nice. And I did better. I did better the second semester because I was just learning rather than being anxious. I was so it was like a different vibe than law school, basically. Like the whole yeah. thing was a different yeah. vibe. But was there like a lot of math involved in that? In no, taxation. no, no. So I'm not a very math savvy tax attorney. That's why I have my calculator. Like okay. a lot of the people I've worked with over the years are very, they're math, they're very mathematical. And I'm like, that's just not really how my, how my brain works. So okay. you know, there is some math, but nothing that you can't do, you know, with, okay. without a calculator. And so you, everybody should note this. Um, you have tremendous experience. 
right? Like, not only did you work in big law, which you mentioned earlier, but you worked at like one of the big five accounting firms for like a year, right? So that would yeah. tell me, tell me when that was. So that was right after the LLM and that was the job that I got mid, mid year. So kind of like in law school, you know, the accounting firms and the big law firms will go to the LLM program and they'll do like on-campus recruiting. Back then, that was 2013, 2012, going into 2013, the economy, you know, was still getting better. So not all the, not all of the law firms were hiring. And so a lot of people, I want to say like half the class ended up going into big four accounting firms. Um, and I remember asking a professor, like, is this a good move? And he's like, you know, it's a great move. You probably won't stay there. Most people don't stay there as attorneys, but it's a great place to start. It's a great, you know, great name on your resume, great experience. And he was right. I really, it didn't, it wasn't a good fit for me long-term, but it was a great experience. And it was like deep dive into corporate America, which my family is like all business owners, entrepreneurs. So I was like, wow, oh, cool. this is it was, it was cool. It was very cool. It was different. Right. So you were there for like a year, then you had one stop. I don't know really what happened at that firm, but then you're at like a big law firm, right? Like for f another, uh, yeah. like, yeah, like five, five years at a big law firm. Yeah. Yeah. So basically I, I realized quickly big four just, it was, I was not, it was like, you know, not a good fit whatsoever. They were great people, really nice people. It just wasn't, it wasn't for me. So I was like, let me go into private practice worked at a couple of boutique firms um, and just one firm in particular, I just dove deep. Like they, I was the only tax associate. They gave me every type of tax matter from estate planning to tax controversy to writing these like opinion letters. And I was there a few years and I think I probably got like seven years worth of experience wow. because I just worked so hard. It was only like three years, but I worked so hard and they, they threw everything at me. It was like, completely sink or swim. It wasn't necessarily like the best environment from like a mental health perspective and a well-being perspective. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, but the the benefit of it was I learned a ton. And so when I left for Holland and Night, one of the partners was like, we're like the Marlins, you know, we train you up and then you just leave us and you leave us and you go to a, a better team. And that, that keeps happening. And I'm like, well, you know, you, Oof. you make us really good tax attorneys. And then the big firms see that and then they they dangle the we're going to more than double your salary wow like, so he was okay. like giving you a little guilt there huh no and he said it with love he's like i totally get it he's like i yeah, would yeah. i would do that too yeah for sure <laughs> one of the good ones did you have to have did you ever have to like cite glenshaw glass i don't know do you even remember no, that no i don't even remember what that's about okay it was i think it was <laughs> anyway it's probably the textbooks i used from like the 1700s probably by now so <laughs> No, we definitely probably, learned it's probably that an irrelevant case. What's that? <laughs> we definitely learned that case, but I just okay. It might not be like a um, case law anymore. Okay, so you're at the you're at a big law firm. Tell it okay. Did, like, tell us what that experience is like. Did they bring by the snack cart at like nine nine p.m. Like when you guys go there? <laughs> like sometimes. Tell tell, sometimes. Us, tell us about the the big law experience. Is it true what they say about just working millions of hours and you know, yeah, yes, yes, that is true. And the, the, the billable hour requirement is insane, especially when you're in trusts and estates. I was just having this conversation with someone earlier. If you're in, say, corporate or real estate and you can bill on one or two clients like the whole day, it's a lot easier to hit your hours. If you're like in an M&A team and you're doing deals and you're working till 3 a.m., you can you can hit your hours. When you're in trusts and estates, you're dealing with so many different matters. And sometimes it's like short snippets of time and it's so much harder to hit your hours, in my opinion, when you're, when you're in the trust and estates world, it's just a different practice okay. area. There was a lot of hours, but what I'll say is, and someone told me this before, I, I was always like, I'm never going to go into big law. I'm never going to do it. Someone told me they're like, it's really about the people you work with. Like the people you work with, the team you're on is going to be like a mini firm within that firm. Okay. So just try to find a good team and hopefully that will help you through the, the craziness. But I mean, the, the expectations are completely unrealistic. Like it's so hard to, without burning out to, to meet those hours. It's crazy. And you did it for five years. I did it for five years. So. And had two babies. How does one? <laughs> what's that? I'm sorry. And had and had two babies <laughs> during I mean, that time. Incredible. That's incredible. So how does one say, okay, I'm going to give up all this, this like office, the snack cart, the salary, and I'm going to start my own firm. How does one do that? I mean, and, one and of the biggest, 
Combine that answer with like, what was the, like, what was the driving force? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always figured I would start my own business. I wasn't sure if it was a law firm or something else. And when I started in big law, I was very intentional. I was like, okay, I know I'm going to be making a lot of money. And I've heard how everyone just spends all that money. So I'm like, I want to take that money and I want to invest in real estate. I want to make sure that I'm being smart. So I'm taking, you know, I'm not just like inflating my lifestyle and putting the golden handcuffs on to the point where they can never come off. Right. Um, and so very early on, like right when I started, I had a really long drive. I was just listening to real estate podcasts and personal finance and self-development and just trying to like figure out how can I survive in this environment and take what I'm doing here and not just wind up like an overworked partner who hates their life and feels like they have no money. And so I looked around as I, as I moved through the career, I looked around at the partners that I was working for and the other partners. And I'm like, no one really seems happy and no one wow. really seems like if they're making all this money, why don't they seem to be taking trips or enjoying it or talking? Right. Like I would talk to people, you know, just, you know, in conversation, money would come up and everyone seemed to have this like scarcity mindset. Like, well, I don't have enough money. I remember so vividly this one conversation with a partner where he was complaining that another partner had retired early. It's probably like late fifties. And he's like, I wish I could do that. And I'm like, you've been making probably close to a million dollars a year for how long? how can you not do that? Like it was right. very, it, it was like an aha moment for me. I'm like, oh, it's not really about the money that you make. It's what you do with it. And it's about your mindset around. You actually mindset. ask him that or was that something you were just thinking? It No, it, I, I didn't ask him that. Okay. That was more just internal. But I think I remember being like, yeah. wow, that's really interesting. Like maybe you could retire. Like, I think I said something like that. I've always been a little bit of a contrarian, but I, I, I was polite about it. But I just remember being like, huh interesting okay so you've worked your life away and you still don't feel like you have enough money and so for me I was like I think I would rather I knew you know I would take a big pay cut for a while leaving the big law firm I was at the point where I was senior associate about to make partner wow I knew I would take a cut but I knew ultimately I will make more money and I'll be able to design it the way that I want it to be. And I have the vision of what I want my life to look like. And I didn't see anyone there who met that vision. I was like, well, I only get this one life and I have these two little kids watching me and seeing what I'm doing. Would I mm -hmm. rather just play it safe and make lots of money and make partner here? Or do I want to really like give it a shot and try to build this life that I see myself living? And that, that for me, it became, it got to the point where it was like, not a choice. I had, I had to quit and start my own firm. Like it was like, not a choice. Like literally I had to go. It's amazing. So tell us about Flourish um, Law Group. So Flourish Law Group is a boutique firm. And like you said, in Florida, where we only focus on trusts and estates and ancillary services. So estate planning, elder law, probate and trust administration, and we're adding real estate closings because clients keep asking and it's just really complimentary. And I run it with my best friend, my college roommate. We're about to go, we're about to uh, hit 20 years of our friendship. So we're going somewhere in August to celebrate. Nice. We run it together and it's been a, just over a year. And we're, we're at that point now where we're building the team. And we were talking about it earlier. The fire hose is, is open. We are flooded with new clients. We're growing wow. like you know, we're not making nearly what we want to make yet because we're we're investing in our business and we're investing in our team, but it's yep. it's really growing. And we're really trying to change estate planning because we've seen how it's done. We've we've both been in this industry, you know, this area of law our entire careers. We see how it's done and it's it's just not very innovative. It's not modern mm -hmm. and it's doing a disservice to Floridians because so many people don't have any estate planning. And then they'll have they'll They'll fam their families will have to hire us for their probate, which is significantly more expensive right. and, you know, arduous than just getting a good plan in place. So what makes you the modern state estate planning firm? A couple of things. So one thing is we really try to harness technology to the greatest extent possible. So we okay. have, you know, Decision Vault, which is a wonderful platform where our clients enter information. We can keep it updated. We meet with our clients every year free of charge to make sure that we are staying on top of their assets and their life so we can continue to Great. use you know, that technology. 
Um, we have what's known as Flourish Vault that we're rolling out where it's basically made like a last pass, but for your life. So you can put your estate planning documents, your financial documents, your, your deed for your home, your operating agreement for your business, all the things. So if you need access to it, you can get it. If you become incapacitated or you pass, there will be a secure system to have the people who you've appointed to receive that information. Oh, wow. Because as the world becomes more digital, assets are going to be lost. I'm not just talking about like, Bitcoin, although that's that's a concern, but assets, people just don't know what their family members have. And if they don't have like paper right. statements around like they used to, right. assets truly lost. Like if you look at like, I'm sure Massachusetts has the same thing. Florida has so much property in the unclaimed property fund. Yeah, like it's insane, yeah. billions of dollars. And it's becoming a problem. And so we're trying to see what is out there that we can harness to make sure that our clients were doing them the best service that we can and make so it's sure all in like one portal, good. like all their important things are in like one portal yeah. where the person yeah. who's like the executor or whatever can find everything. Yeah. yeah. What's the, the like the smallest, exactly. like for what's like the smallest um, document or item that would go into that portal of somebody's I'm just, that's just, I'm curious. Smallest, like in what? In what sense? Just like a, uh, like, would it be like the title to a car? Or like, would it be like? Oh, uh, yeah. Title to a car, your children's vaccination records, your okay. passport, or like and anything, anything and everything at all that you need at some point or that your family might need can go in there. Is it accessible, like, during the period where, like, mm -hmm. you're still uh, around if you need to go yeah. in and change yeah. it? Yeah. So it's so cool. We're using it too. And we're like, wow, this is amazing. You yeah. Know, that's really we're, cool. We're excited about it too. I mean, yeah. people, so I think if it's... you think the old days, right. They had like right here, I have a podcast file of like my notes from all my episodes and I have it in a file. It's like that thick, you know? So it's, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, I, it's, it's interesting concept that everything can be in one centralized portal and you're, you're really like utilizing that right now. And that, I think that does yeah. definitely make you a modern estate planning law firm. How does some of the, uh, elderly feel about that? I think with the elderly clients, what we're seeing the most is that their adult children are just helping them. You know, they're okay. just helping them put everything in there because so, I mean, some, some of our older clients are really tech savvy and some aren't. And so they, that's when they have that, or we, we have concierge services where we can help as well, especially for the high net worth clients that we have. They, they love that because we can actually help them put everything in there. We can work with their, you know, their house estate manager, whatever it is, their admin, their assistant and, and get it all in there. Okay. Wow. Okay. So what kind of clients are you taking right now? So we have a couple of different like main target clients. So we have high net worth clients that are doing estate and gift tax planning, you know, with, without getting too taxy, there's, there's an exemption amount that's going to be cut in half potentially at the end of 2025 for estate and gift tax purposes. So we have a lot of high net worth clients that are looking at that now, looking into making gifts before they, they lose the ability um, to, to make those gifts. Um, we also have a lot of just regular, normal families, you know, people with children, businesses, homes that want to make sure they're avoiding probate that want to understand what is a revocable trust? What is a will? What's a power of attorney? And they want to be educated because there is a lack of education out there. And so many of our calls are just a lot of just education and explaining to people what it all means. And you put on like a free seminar for people too, right? Mm -hmm. I, I saw yeah, we, we do a lot of webinars, yeah. we do workshops, you know, we do workshops with like Memorial Healthcare down here, YMCA, like we're we're doing lots of different things to try to just get it out into the community. That's really, that's really Because estate planning is for everyone. We have a lot of wealthy clients, but it's not just about the wealth. So. What would you say to like a younger, a younger, um, Are there little ones here, Coco? <laughs> a younger person who doesn't have like an estate plan yet, like a younger family, like what, what would be your advice to just, maybe they haven't accumulated that much yet, or like maybe they just need a simple will or whatnot. <laughs> Um, I mean, really anyone who's 18 or over should have something. Okay. They should have a power of attorney and they should have a healthcare surrogate. What we we do with our clients is when we have clients with college age children, we'll just do that document for them for free. Because you think about it, your children go off to college, they're now adults. If you need to make a financial decision on their behalf or a healthcare decision, you're no longer their guardian. A lot of people don't think about that. So really anyone who's 18 or over should have something. And then you build from there. Then maybe you just, you know, need a will. And then maybe once you have children, that's when you want to start thinking about getting a revocable trust in place. 
Um, and then you kind of build from there. But a lot of people are really surprised to realize that they need this and they yeah. just they just don't know. You know, it's just not a part of a normal conversation that we're having on a day-to-day basis, unless you're us and then it's all day. Right, right. So um what I just I kind of lost my train of thought there. So what's that term like a sheet to the state? Like we wouldn't want everything to a sheet to the to the state or yeah. I mean, probate, right? Like that would be yeah. That's very expensive. Yeah. Probate it's is right? probate is much more process. common. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, probate it's like two to seven percent of your estate. It can take up to a year to get access to assets. Yeah. Like it's it is such a pain and it's so easy to right. avoid. And it's so common. Even when we see we have clients that come to us, you know, their mom or dad has passed or both. And they had an estate plan and they had some things moved into a trust and they had like two accounts that didn't have, you know, a transfer on death. And then it's yeah. a probate. And it's like, oh man, like that would have taken five minutes if you just went online and filled out a form. Right. Uh, but people just don't know. And so much of what we do is educating and then like making sure we know what your assets are and be like, go double check what this is. Do you have a financial advisor? Get them on the meeting with us, making sure right. that you're good. You know, that's, that's right. a big part of it too. Just organizing. With some of your yeah, higher. Do a sheet, you know, yeah, what, things can what, a sheet. I just wanted to kind of say the word. So like with some of your. <laughs> it's such a fun word. <laughs> with some of your higher um, net worth clients. Do you find that your uh, University of Florida LLM experience comes into play at all? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, for sure. So when it comes to the high net worth clients, like we're always doing those foundational documents, the revocable trust, the will, all of that. But then we're doing like N plus plus. So we're doing, you know, tax planning. So let's say they have 40 million and let's say it's a, you know, a, a, a dad with adult children, you no know, wife. What are we going to do? Are we going to create an irrevocable trust for the benefit of those kids? We're, we're moving, you know, business interests into that trust so they can use their exemption. The assets can grow outside of their kids' estates. Predator protection. Um, the tax planning definitely comes into play uh, with the high net worth clients. And, and income tax planning, too. You know, we have a lot of even non-high net worth clients. We see people coming in and they're adding kids to deeds and it's creating like huge capital gains tax issues because there's a distinction between giving a property and inheriting. Like if you inherit, you get your parents' um, fair market value death basis. You can sell mm -hmm. it the next day and not pay any tax, wow. income tax. Right. Just little things like that, that that comes up a lot. So yes, the, the LLM comes up quite a bit um, and helps a lot with the tax planning. And then my partner, her background is more so probate and trust administration. So she's right. really the one who's driving that side of the practice. Very nice. And then we can collaborate on everything else. So tell us about the Wealthy Lawyer Squad. So the Wealthy Lawyer Squad is it's my baby. It's a community for new law students or for law students and new lawyers. One, to have a sense of community because I felt very much nice. alone when I started my lawyer journey. Um, and it's it's a place where we can actually have like positive conversations, learn how to go through the process in a way that will hopefully be much more positive and not hurting our well-being. So it's it's a it's a combination of things. It's a community. It's a coaching program. So there's a coaching program for uh, law students that I launched in 2021. Okay. And then I'm launching the coaching program for new lawyers. Um, my first cohort is starting on, on July 15th of this year. Wow. And it's going to be similar to the the law school blueprint, um, success blueprint, but focusing more on your first couple of years as an attorney. What is that experience going to be like? How are you going to protect and you know make sure your mentally your your mental health is very secure? How are you going to make sure you're networking and using your time efficiently? How are you going to make sure that you're you know paying attention to your personal finances and not just getting stuck in the golden handcuffs? So it's it's the wealthy lawyer squad is wealth, not just money. Although money is a big part of it, it's mental wealth, it's physical wealth, and it's truly your money. Yeah. Wow. That oh, that sounds like so great to have some a tool to have did you ever have a mentor in in law school or being a lawyer i know you said you, your family wasn't lawyers but not really and i think that was partially my fault of not oh, okay. seeking not seeking out men i mean i think it was a combination it was you know not knowing where to look not knowing who to ask not knowing how to even approach a mentor i just even even knowing how to find a mentor and asking them to be your mentor is like a very special skill um so really i haven't it, it's been like the past year that I truly feel like I have mentors both in the law and outside now that I'm on my own and I'm getting more comfortable with 
asking for help and asking for advice and allowing people to to help me. That's like very hard for me. Like when people like try to help, I'm like, what do you want from me? And they're like, nothing. I just want to help you. Like right. that's very new. For right, me. right. And I think like wealthy and the wealthy lawyer squad, I think like that has a broad definition. It's like you said, it's not just money, it's mental yeah. health. It's it's like everything. Yeah. Yeah, we do group coaching calls where we'll talk about different topics like how do you overcome anxiety and stress or how do you build your confidence or who do you see yourself in five years? How do we reverse engineer that? Or what do you, what is your money story and what is your money situation and how can we focus on that? Right. Um, you know, it's events like, like my, we'll talk about it, in, I think in a bit, but it, you know, events and retreats and just positive experiences. I mean, happy hours are awesome. And I love, I love cocktails, but I want there to be other types of events yeah. that lawyers and law students can go to that are not just focused around alcohol. And again, like, I mean, come on, I love a drink, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I want yeah. there to be other types of events that are different, you know, out there. <laughs> Guilty. No, I, yeah, I, I, I hear you. You know, that is, it, it, we definitely need those other types of events, or at least, you know, yeah. have that panel first and then grab a drink, right? Like do something a little more substantial. Yeah. I hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. So you're covering a lot of topics that law students need. Now, is this just for uh, Florida law students or uh, St. Thomas law students or tell us who this is geared towards? It's geared towards any law student in nice. the U.S. or even outside of the U.S. I mean, the issues that law students are facing are are the same across the board. I think in the U.S. we're a little bit unique. I mean, the mental health stats in law, we all know, are really bad. They're really, really bad. Like, and they're getting worse. Every, they're doing studies like ABA's done studies. and like, wow, it's not getting better. It's, it's right. getting worse. And I think right. that so much of that is just the culture, obviously, and the environment and the conversations that we're having and the stressors. And I know that there's ways that we can deal with this better. And I'm really trying to figure out how to bring that to the legal community. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing like what what drives you to do all this because you know here you are you know big five is it the four big four um accounting firm huge like law firm like big law firm very well known launch your own firm and now you're like giving back like you want to help people you like genuinely want to people don't do this unless they genuinely want to take time out of their day and like watch other people succeed so like what drives you I mean, it's really something that I'm building something that I wish I would have had. Yeah. You know, when I, when I started in big law, I kind of alluded to this. I really, I took a deep dive. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to survive, I need to understand my brain and I need to focus on my personal development. I need to fix what's going on in here. I need to fix my money. I need to fix all the things. And I focused on, it. I like took this deep dive and I just wanted to be okay and I just want to survive. But what happened was I actually started thriving and partners were like, wow, you seem so confident and you're making these like really, you know, beyond your years, like tax analysis that you're sitting in a meeting and bringing up and like, what happened? And I'm like, I'm just feeling good. I'm meditating. I'm working out. I'm focusing on myself. I'm feeling autonomy over my career and my money. And mm -hmm. that took a lot of the stress away of just like, I just want to be a good attorney and I just want to do a good job rather than like trying to people please, you know, everybody at the same time, which is, you know, like, that so I it. you keep referring to like money, right? So like, and I know it could be a sore spot for some people and, or, or not a sore spot, but like a, like a sort of like a touchy spot. Right. So mm -hmm. when you're referring to money, are you referring to like law students or like kids right out of law school? Like, cause you know, there are obviously law students who have like thousands and thousands of dollars of debt. So like, how do you, what do you say to them or how are they receiving help from you? So when we talk about money in the law school success blueprint, we always start with what is your money story? How did you grow up in your household? Okay. How was money discussed? How do you view money? How, like what types of feelings do you get? Do you get really stressed out? Do you wow. get excited? Do you get motivated? Do you get like afraid? If you make money, would you just immediately spend it? Because my observations that like, arguably the highest level in law firms was that people weren't, they didn't have good money stories. And so they were making poor decisions and they were making decisions in their career from a place of fear rather than a, from a place of feeling empowered. And so starting with that with law students, how do you view your money? And then talking about money, just like as, you know, just between us, like, hey, here's what I'm making. Here's what I'm doing in my yeah. life. I invest 
real estate. Here's some books that we can talk about and have a book club over personal finance. So when you do go out into the world and start making money, you do make good money choices. And you and if you're maybe not making the best, you can at least recognize why you're doing that and you can approach it and, and change things. And also the student loan debt, like it's a huge elephant in the room, right? Like yeah. students are leaving with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. And I always tell my students that that have, you know, not everyone has law school debt, but a lot of people do. I say, number one, let's like take the emphasis away from the bad. Like is, is, the, is education in the US insanely expensive? Yes. Are you accumulating all of this debt? Maybe. But when you sit in your house, like I'm sitting in my house right now, I don't just think about how bad my mortgage is all day, every day. And I tell the students, like you made an investment in yourself. Yep. Don't just think about it negatively. Don't just complain about it all the time with your friends. You know, I'm not saying it's like puppies and roses, but if you've made this decision, you made an investment. Okay. So we can think about it all the time and be stressed out by it, or we can move forward with our lives and think about it in a different way. That's amazing, Lauren. Like I honestly sitting here have like, I don't remember talking or hearing about it that way. And if I was a law student, I mean, that, that right there is just like really powerful to talk to a group of law students and say, you know, this talk about your money story. Like, and I mean, getting people to open up about it is difficult sometimes. And you just mentioned, like, let's talk about like how much we make in this position. I mean, people don't even like to talk about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so that's, that is yeah. like a tremendous thing and a tremendous asset if you can continue to talk to law students about that because, um, you know, that's definitely something I wish I had more of like, I just feel like I took, you know, took out money and was like, I'm going to law school like that. You know, I didn't even really, I didn't have a Same. clue, you know, I, I really, I, maybe I didn't, I don't give myself enough credit, but I do think it, it's very, maybe I didn't want to think about how much it was, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I never that's super helpful. Like, and you know, that seems like, and, and seriously, like that's the first time I've heard somebody, an attorney say that they're talking to other law students about that. So I think you really have something great. Thank you. And, it, and again, it's just, it's things that I wish I would have known when I was in law school, when I was going into my first few years of practice, you know, I really wish I would have known that yeah. and just having the conversations and putting it out on the table, it takes so much of that fear out of it it takes the oxygen out of it and just oh okay it's just debt. it's yeah. dead it's dead people are coming out of law school and they're playing it's like they're paying two mortgages you know or two rents I, I mean it's, I it's crazy but that yeah. that's amazing. yeah i don't mean to like i never mean to like discount how hard it can be and how scary right. it can be but it's it's a neutral circumstance debt is neutral you can choose how you feel about it and you right. can choose the decisions that you make because of it Right. So that's great. Like, I hope you, I hope you, uh, keep going with that and help like thousands of law students, um, and new lawyers. So yeah. tell me about, you had a recent retreat, um, empower her retreat for women in the law. Um, and this came from a conversation you had with somebody, a colleague, you were at lunch and they're like, Oh, nobody's happy being a lawyer. And you were kind of like, what? And then you put <laughs> up this whole thing. Like maybe just give us a little backstory about it. Yeah. Yeah. So the retreat came to be, I'm in a networking group here in Florida called the daily drip, which is, I, I joined like right when I started my firm and it's been one of the best decisions I've made because the, the women and men, it's a group for women, but there's men involved like completely. And the women in there are just, and the men are just incredible. And they were so supportive of me. And so I'm a thought leader, meaning I write and I speak and I, I go to events. And so there's a group of us and another um, woman in the group owns a retreat company. They do high-end retreats, yoga oh, cool. retreats. They go to Thailand and Peru and, and they do local yes. events too. And she approached me and she's like, I see what you're doing with the wealthy lawyer squad. I really love it. I think we should do something for women in the law, like a, like a half day yoga retreat. And I was like, I love that idea because when I started meditating and doing yoga, I became a better attorney from that experience. Wow. And it's been a practice of mine for years. I mean, <laughs> it's probably no surprise that as attorneys, our nervous systems are like shot to hell. Like we're, we're constantly in fight or flight mode. We're constantly in stress. And so if you never bring that back down, we're just living like, that's not good for your hormones as men or women. It's just, it's not good. So she came to me and I was like, this is a great idea. I absolutely love this. And so we had people from bar associations and law schools and law firms. We had law firms sponsoring it. We did yoga. We did a sound bath. We did a panel with some 
incredible lawyers and mental health and doctors on the, on the panel. It was just so, so great. And all the women were sitting around saying, we need to really, this needs to be big. We need to do this. We need to bring this to, you know, Florida and beyond because it was just such a great day of connection and relaxation. And like, I don't like the self-care is like getting so played out, but I left and I was like, I feel so good. I really, I needed that. I've been burning them, you know, burning the minute oil, trying to run a firm and be a mom and coach law students. And it's a lot, yeah. you know, yeah. and I love it all. And I think when we love it all, we can do it even like too much, you know, because we just want to keep going. Right. Um, yeah. And it was, it was such a success and I'm so excited to get the law schools more involved and all the law firms. It's, I'm still like on a high from it. Yeah. It was just this yeah. weekend. This past weekend. What, how was the attendance? Yeah. Pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah. I think May is a tough month. We had about 20. Yeah. Um, okay. That's good. So wow. there were a lot of people who couldn't come, but we're going to do another one in the fall. And I have a feeling it's just going to be. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. like a hundred more, you know. People. I hope. Yeah. That goal. sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Congrats on, on that. You're doing Thank so you. much. Um, Thank you. See, we talked about money. Um, so I have like a, I have something written down about expectations and money. Did we touch on that or no? I don't know if like that came out at all. And, um, so is there something um, with expectations and money or no? I mean, I'm not sure. Like I'm not sure exactly what that refers to, okay. but it might be, it might just be like, I love to tell people what I make now and what I've made in the past and, uh, and in between and when I started like I like explaining and kind of peeling back the veil of like here's what you'll make as an attorney and yeah. talking about that and I like to talk about multiple streams of income you know and and that was something that like shook me when I was started reading about personal finance I'm like oh so many lawyers just have one stream of income and that all of my clients in big law were wealthy right none of them had wealth stream one stream of income they had multiple streams of income. They had real estate. They owned businesses. And I started seeing this pattern. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm probably not going to become wealthy just doing this one thing. Wow. Okay. Um, and that you that primary was job though, if if you have like another job, do they get do they are they like fishing around for you doing something that you shouldn't be doing? You know what I'm saying? Like I mean, it doesn't have to be another job. It can be investing in the stock market. It can be yeah. buying, okay. it can be buying real estate. You know, it can be so many things. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. true. I mean, they might, they might, but I think, I think the world is changing where people are becoming so much more multifaceted that if law firms really pushed back on that, I think yeah. they would, it would be a problem. Right. I, yeah, I agree. People are always, like, there's a lot of people have online presence and presence now, and they really just have to accept it um, as long as it's appropriate and somewhat professional, I guess. Uh, of course. But, so you're on a this is so you're on a heartfelt mission to empower you're hosting free estate planning workshops for single mothers and ensuring no family is left vulnerable tell us a little bit about that i mean so much of what we do like i said with our firm with flourish law group is is truly education based because we have these conversations all day every day they're high net worth or not. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know this. I didn't know like just little things or big things sometimes. And so we really are heartfelt in that we want people to know what good estate planning is, to have access to it and to have their families protected. I, I, we, my law partner and I both started being picky because all of our clients, our clients were only high net worth. Like it's not fair that the top one, only the top 1% of the top 1% have access to this information because it applies to everybody. Um, right. You know, and so that's a big part of what we do and the conversations we have and the way that we build our business and our brand. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, good for you. Give them back. Um, yeah. Such a young, successful attorney. Congrats on all your, uh, everything you're doing. It's amazing. Um, Lauren, did we leave anything out? Is there any other advice you wanted to share or anything you were hoping to touch on? I mean, I would just say, especially to newer lawyers or, or those who are still in law school and that are watching or listening, like just figure out who you want to be and what mm -hmm. you care about and what you want your life to look like. And maybe your first few years out, you know, won't meet that or match what you want to do, but don't lose sight of that and make your decisions from that place. You know, just 
you can really do whatever you want to do and be whoever you want to be. Like, look for evidence of people doing really cool things or living really cool lives. There, there, it's out there. There's a lot of attorneys who are absolutely thriving and living their dream. So just keep keep sight of that even in the beginning when it might be really tough. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I wish uh, I heard about that too, when like a hundred years ago when I was hey. in school. Um, <laughs> Lauren Klein, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Attorney Flourish Law Group, Florida. Uh, please stay right there. Everybody else, thanks for tuning in wherever you are in the world today. Enjoy yourselves. Cheers.